evening. I want to talk a few things about the controversy that came up uh, this week in Mawa, New Jersey, about the A roof. Um, there's, first of all, there's a lot of misinformation about the A roof. Uh, most people assume that the strings are the A roof. Now, the way the concept of the A roof, according to the Jewish tradition, dates back to King Solomon. And there are t three types of A roof.
it essentially is the same as, the, as putting it down. Even carrying it and standing still is considered like putting it down as well. So there's a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated law. So like I mentioned before, we have this that we call the Carmelist. That is a rabbinically decreed public domain. Biblically speaking, it should be considered a private uh, a private domain, but it has all the essential trappings of a public domain. However, the biblical definition of a public domain in general is only have to have 600,000 people, just like the 600,000 left Egypt, and so forth. And so a public domain in a rural area that doesn't have some, or even a suburban area, uh, within that, those confines could not have the definition of a public domain, biblically speaking. However, the rabbis decreed it to be a public domain. And since the rabbis decreed it as such, they could also create various parameters in which it could be considered a shared private domain. Um, a, ancient times this was discussed, for example, a shared um, courtyard, which we still have today. And even the simplest uh, example of this today, which really is the crux of what I want to discuss, would even be, for example, a uh, an apartment building or a hotel. Now, an apartment building, you have you know, each apartment is a separate private domain, and the and the uh, hallway is essentially a public domain. So, if I'm carrying from one apartment to another within the same building, does this? Um, is this breaking the Sabbath because I'm carrying? And according to the rabbinical laws of the Carmelists, it, it should, it, the, the uh, hallway should be considered Carmelist, should be considered a private domain, a public domain, rabbinically speaking, a rabbinical public domain, a Carmelist, and therefore it should be forbidden to carry. The answer, though, is to declare that we are sharing this as a community, as a single private domain in a shared sense, in a communal sense. And so this term Eruv, which we said means mixing, so here we're essentially mixing the, the definition of this rabbinically instituted public domain, we are declaring it to be a shared private domain. Not that it belongs to any one individual, but it belongs <coughs> in a communal sense to all of those who share in, in that area and so therefore it becomes permitted. So how does one do it? Does that mean in your apartment building you have to put up strings? Not at all. The barriers <coughs> are the walls of the apartment building. So there you have which is much stronger to declare it a, a single domain than the strings, but yet you still have to be here. So what does that mean? Well, that means someone has to, and the same thing, let's say you have an enclosed courtyard, a shared courtyard, that all the apartments share, and it's outdoors. Same thing. The question is, what then is the A-roof? So the actual Eruv would be a piece of bread or some other food, uh, generally it would be bread, that is declared to be shared to all of the people who live in, within this shared uh, courtyard. Then the question comes, how? what other ways can we consider this area to be shared. Now, let's say you have, a, you know, like the old city of Jerusalem is surrounded by a wall. 
you have to declare, you know, one piece of bread. What some synagogues will do is they'll have some pizza. And every, um, they'll usually do that once a year, declare this box of matzah to, uh, to be the Arab for the community. But really, you could just declare a piece of bread every week. That's just as good. Now, um, now, so where does it come in the strings and, and the poles and this and that? So, let's look back at our example of the old city of Jerusalem. So, you have openings of the of the walls so it's not totally walled in so then you have what we call the form of a door the Tzuras HaPesach the form of the door generally speaking if you look at how a door is made it's the arch of a door you have two lintels and then you have a, a cross piece on top so you have to have something directly under the top of the and that's how you make this form of a door and so you know for example with the walls of Jerusalem there is one area that doesn't even have an arch over the top um, so how do we declare it the form of a door and so there they put string, a string to connect the walls and also underneath the string are the two lintels called lechi, a lechi and a korah, and that's what forms the form of a door. Uh, it doesn't have to be a string, it could be a board, it could be anything, just the reason we use string is because that's the least uh, obtrusive. Um, essentially, if you have uh, wires that already exist, those wires could be the string, but it's still underneath that. In order to form a door, this, the shape of a door, you attach something to to the poles. Uh, so you, you would have to have something underneath the strings where they attach. Now they don't have to go all the way up, but they can go somewhat up, and as long as it's directly underneath the wire, that forms the form of a door. Uh, this is not, you know, now a lot of people will say attaching a lechi or a string and so forth to electric poles. Um, that sounds like, in, in, in order to create the form of a door that would, and so theoretically you could make the whole air of, out of the form of a door, and just everything would be just strings. You don't have to have a fence or a wall. If you have a fence or a wall, it's much better. Uh, but if you don't have the fence or the wall, so out with using the strings, we make this what we call the form of a door, the Tzuras HaPesach. Uh, by having the strings and having something, some pole or board or something underneath that is directly underneath. It doesn't have to go all the way up because it's considered, once it's there, it's considered as if it's going all the way up. Uh, so as long as it's a certain height, that's sufficient and it can't be too high off the ground. There's many laws about it. But the thing is, is that some people will say the following, um, that placing a lechi or, or the kora as well, the strings, um, on these poles, that's putting a religious symbol on, the, um, on, on this public area. You know, what if someone would want to attach crucifixes to the poles? I, I personally don't have a problem, and people put crucifixes all over on public land. It doesn't bother me. Um, 
happens all the time, especially, you know, memorials where there was accidents and so forth. People place crucifixes and they're Christians and it doesn't, then why, why should that bother me? I, I, I mean, this country was founded on biblical values that are shared by, they share Judeo-Christian values um, that Orthodox Jews share with Christians. Um, the people who are offended by that are not they say, well, it's because I'm Jewish. It's not because it's not the Orthodox Jews who get offended by that. It's the secular Jews who want to destroy all religion. The former Jews um, who are really behind these things. And we've seen it in the past. Um, most of the time, any fights against constructing an Eruv have always come from self-hating Jews. We saw, saw this in the Hamptons. Um, there was a show on the Daily Show about this. It showed how ridiculous this fight was. The same thing, I wouldn't be surprised if the people really behind this in Mawa, even though they're showing all these faces of non-Jews, who really woke up, stirred the pot of this? Most likely it was secular Jews. Uh, I, uh, secular former Jews. And when I say secular Jews, again, I don't mean people who you know, uh, even though some of those might go to the temple on Yom Kippur, but that's, uh, you know, and, uh, people, you know, there are people who are not through, but who don't fight against Torah, who don't fight against religion, who have respect for religion, and they recognize it to be true, they're just not ready for it yet, you know, or they have their own lifestyle, but they have respect for religion, but there is this very old fight against religion. It's most likely rooted in the Sabbatean and Frankist movements, these false messianic movements um, that uh, start in the 1600s. Um, and uh, these very dangerous movements, um, if you, particularly if you study the writings of Jacob Emden, um, that Orthodox Jews and Christians should unite against this scourge of the anti-religious and anti Personally, 
obligation to perform evil, wicked things in order to lift up the holy sparks that are hidden within these evil, wicked things. And, uh, it's a deliberate misinterpretation of Kabbalah. And, you know, if you study authentic texts, uh, I mean, we see the, the Tanya, for example, which is a seventh Hasidic text, particularly in Chabad. Tanya tells us that for the Shalosh, Klipos, and Timaeus, you cannot make a Tikkun, you cannot make a, a, a Lisa and Saitzis. You can't pick up uh, holy sparks by utilizing um, things that are forbidden by the Torah, even though it seems that there has crept into the modern day movement that calls itself Chabad, uh, this ideology of sin and, and Tikkun and, and so forth in a very dark way, uh, but the original Chabad ideology opposed this. Um, that's neither here nor there. The point that I wanted to make, though, is that even though I don't have a problem 